I never intended to become an activist. When I became a doctor, it was disruptive enough to my family. My daughter, when she was in grade 12, wrote an essay entitled, My Deprived Childhood. <laughs> it began, when I was 14, my mother decided to return to university to study medicine. That was the last day she made my lunch. <laughs> and the hardships got worse as the paper <laughs> went on. By the time I graduated and finished my internship, my plate was really full. I had a new medical practice, a new relationship with a man named Russell, a new blended family of seven kids, most of them in their teenage years. The last thing I needed was a cause. But <laughs> one rainy December evening in 1984, I went up to the university to hear Dr. Helen Caldicott speaking about nuclear weapons. Dr. Caldicott was an Australian pediatrician, and she'd been speaking on this issue around the world. So I went up and listened to her, and I was shocked to the core. 60,000 nuclear weapons? We had 60,000? We could wipe out all life on Earth in an afternoon. When I got home, I couldn't sleep. In fact, for three nights, I couldn't sleep. I'd lie in bed, freezing cold, and thinking of all the arguments that I could give to Dr. Helen Caldicott. So I said, I don't think your numbers can be right. And she said back to me, so go check them. They're, they're, they're from the Pentagon. Go ahead and check them. And I said, yeah, but I'm not one of those people, you know, that kind of person placard carrying, strident, marching kind of person. And she said, no, of course not. We need everyone. We need all people, or we won't turn this around. She said, we need women. We need mothers speaking out. We need doctors. We need teachers. We need writers. And we need people who are willing to speak in public. Well, for me, the questions then became really intense uh, around the core of my existence. And I found myself asking, why is there life instead of nothing? And why am I alive right now? A woman, a doctor, a teacher, a writer, and a mother. And, and I'm thinking, I just don't want to become active. But finally, I could not continue to be sleepless. So I got up in the morning and made arrangements to go to a meeting of Women's Peace Movement and the Doctors' Peace Movement. And I've continued with those ever since. What I first did then, when I got there, I had no idea what to do. So I said, OK, so here I am. What should I do? And they said, well, nobody knows what to do, really. Uh, so if you see something that looks like it has promise, take the first step and go ahead and do it. And if, any, if anyone ever asks you to speak, always say yes. <laughs> so with those two pieces of advice, I started out speaking in church halls and community centers and in the Peace Walk. And gradually, as I got asked to speak more and more, the next step seemed to get higher and a lot more scary every time. And I ended up seeing inside places I never dreamed that I would see. Listening to Mother Teresa at the United Nations. Meeting with Gorbachev in the Kremlin. This is a photograph from later with Gorbachev in, in Rome. Meeting with the Pope in the Vatican. Meeting with colleagues in North Korea to talk about the dangers of nuclear weapons. As I began to, to look at what I was doing, um, I began to realize that I count on you out there while I'm working on nuclear weapons. I assume that you're out there saving the oceans and the rainforests and that you are protecting women against violence and that you're working in a school giving breakfast to kids who come to school hungry. We all are moving in the same direction, and we can't do it all. And obviously, I met a lot of amazing people, very inspiring people, not 
It wasn't the famous who inspired me nearly as much as the unassuming and unrecognized ones, like the executive director of the Philippines, the Manila YWCA. We were both speakers at a peace meeting in 1987 in Honolulu. She was a little tiny woman, navy blue suit, really conservative black shoes, and um, after she'd finished her speech, the audience all leaned forward because Ferdinand Marcos had been deposed that year. So they said, were you involved with the overthrow of Ferdinand Marcos? And she looked surprised. She said, well, yes, I was. I lay on the road to keep the tanks from coming into the downtown, and the other women brought food and water for four days. <sighs> Just knocked the breath out of me. And I thought, I thought I had challenges? Nothing compared to lying on the middle of a road to keep the tanks out from downtown. Marcos was deposed when three million Filipinos went into the streets of Manila and stayed there until he fled four days later. So now I'm in the position where after I finish a talk, people come up to me and say, well, I know what you're doing, but what should I do about this issue? And of course I can't answer that. All I can say is, I can give you a couple of guidelines, um, to a couple of ideas. The first one is, break the silence. There's a silence that is taken to mean consent and agreement and even support for the status quo. We don't agree with it, so speak out. And speak out everywhere. To everyone you know, everywhere, all the time, and right now. I think of what kids did in the Cold War. A young girl named Samantha Smith wrote to then the head of the Soviet Union, and she wrote him a lovely letter. Dear Mr. Andropov, congratulations on your new job. And then she said how frightened she was about the danger of nuclear war and why were the Soviet people so determined to rule the world and to, and to start a war. And Mr. Andropov responded with a very thoughtful and long letter, inviting her to come to the Soviet Union to speak to him and to the Soviet people. So she did. She went to Moscow and she spoke on Soviet television to 240 million people, and the Soviets just embraced her. They took her into their hearts. And after that, just a few short years later, she died tragically in a plane crash with her father when she was 16, and the entire Soviet Union grieved her as a national hero. An amazing story. And Gorbachev took office a few years later. He was negotiating a nuclear weapons uh, treaty, an arms control treaty, with President Reagan, and he wrote at that time of the profound effect on him of all of the hundreds of thousands of letters that he received from children all over the world. So the little things that we do, even with kindergarten kids, do make a difference. Remember, the small acts make a difference. When you speak to someone, speak from the heart. It's interesting that I've learned that people really don't want to know all the statistics I want to tell them. They really want to know why I'm doing what I'm doing. And for you, what they're going to want to know is from your heart, what is it that has moved you to give up a ski weekend in order to go to a meeting? That's what they want to know, and that's what will help them to understand and to take action as well. I'm thinking of some of the things that, um, that I've learned over the 30 years in the peace movement, and one is that the person across the table, the person that you think is your enemy, probably is not. And above all, you should not address that person as the enemy. The, the prime case I think of is the first time I went to Moscow, my translator was this man, Sasha Agapiev. This was 1986. Now, of course, he would be the enemy, right? He's the translator. He must be a spy for the government. He can tell them every word that we're saying and every place that we're going with this delegation of doctors. So I tried to brush him off. I tried to avoid him, and whenever he came around me, I would turn away. But he stuck to me like a burr. <laughs> like a chain-smoking burr. 
So at the end of the first evening, we were all exhausted from, from meetings. I sat down at dinner, and Sasha came and sat beside me, and I was too tired to do anything, so I just listened to him. And I discovered that this was a man who played with the English language like a stand-up comic. And the butt of all of his humor was the Soviet communist system. That was his gentle target. And I was fascinated by listening to him and his vast, vast knowledge. So I'll just give you a flavor of Sasha. Uh, when, when he was translating for me at, at a banquet, it, the, it was customary that I would say two or three sentences, and then he would translate, and I would carry on. So I'd finished my last two sentences and sat down, turned to him, and he talked and talked and talked and <laughs> talked and talked. And finally I said, what are you doing, Sasha? I didn't say all of that. I'm shaking his sleeve. He said, Mary, it was what you meant to say. <laughs> <laughs> when, when we got back to the hotel <laughs> on this bus, we got off, and Sasha pulled out a cigarette carton and wrote on the top flap and handed it to me, and he said, Mary, this is my telephone number. While you are in Moscow, if there is anything at all that you need, you call me, and I will tell you how to live without it. <laughs> so, speak, speak from the heart and break the silence. My second point is sing together. And I mean sing together in the metaphoric sense and in the literal sense. In the metaphoric sense, I mean it because we're all on this path together, and we should be singing in harmony. So to do that, I have to actually listen to the guy beside me, even though I can't stand him, because we have to tune our voices to each other to sing in harmony. And I mean it in the literal sense, that we must sing together, because it's one thing to watch a beautiful performer out there, but it's quite another thing to sing together and to feel the power of our own voices. Music is not a trivial part of social change. It is a powerful force that unites us, it gives us courage, it sustains us, inspires us, and brings us joy. In the revolutions in Lithuania, Latvia, and Estonia, music was a core part of those nonviolent revolutions. You know, rock music was banned in the Soviet Union and in Czechoslovakia. The plastic people of the universe were in prison all the time in Czechoslovakia because rock music was seen to be subversive. And it is subversive, right? It is subversive. When I think back to the Cold War, every meeting we ever had, we all stood and sang, we shall overcome. And I remember the thrill of being in a peace walk with 8,000 people when the crowd broke into John Lennon's song, all we are saying is give peace a chance. Give peace a chance. So, I have a gift for you. And the gift is a song that has sustained me for years and years when I've been exhausted or jet-lagged or disillusioned it's called One More Step. It's written by songwriter Joyce Poley, Vancouver singer-songwriter. And this is a part of Dennis Donnelly's arrangement. So I'd like you all to stand up, if you don't mind. You're going to love singing, right? <laughs> OK. So I'm going to sing a line, and then you'll sing it back to me, and then I'll sing the second line. You'll sing it's only two lines long. It's not hard. <laughs> so it goes like this. Mm, there's our note. One more step. I will take one more step. And now it's your turn. One more step. I will take one more step, my turn. Till there is peace on earth for everyone, I'll take one more step, your turn. Till there is peace on earth for everyone, I'll take one more step. You're great. Back to the beginning. 
One more step, I will take one more step, till there is peace on earth for everyone. I'll take one more step. Now we change the word. One more song, I will sing one more song, till there is peace on earth for everyone. I'll sing one more song, prayer. One more prayer, I will say one more prayer, till there on earth for everyone. I'll say one more prayer. And the next one is my very own. (laughs) You ready? One more check. I will write one more check till there is peace on earth for everyone. I'll write one more check. Back to the beginning. One more step. I will take one more step till there is peace on earth for everyone. I'll take one more step. And we'll repeat the last line. Till there is peace on earth for everyone. I'll take one 